Hello and welcome. My name is Rachel Leach and today I'm joined by Liz Pygram on violin, Gillian Haddo on viola, Rebecca Gilliver on cello, Rupert Ring on double bass, Jonathan Lipton on French horn, Adam McKenzie on bassoon and James Burke on clarinet. And together we're going to explore Beethoven's septet in E-flat movement one. Beethoven was born in Bonn in 1770, and like Mozart, Beethoven's dad was ambitious and wanted his son to be a child star. But Beethoven was rebellious and grumpy, and said later on in his life that he hated nothing more than to sit at the keyboard with his dad. Despite this, he did have exceptional talent and published his first pieces at the age of 13. In 1787, Beethoven traveled to Vienna to meet and hopefully study with his idol, who was Mozart. But on the way, his mother grew sick and Beethoven had to turn back. We don't think the two great men ever met. When Mozart died a few years later, it was decided that Beethoven should go and study with the next best thing, Haydn. But Beethoven didn't get on with Haydn. He found the old man stuffy and old-fashioned. And Haydn, being the nicest man of all time, simply said that Beethoven was a genius and the true successor to Mozart. And so yet again, on the screen, we have those three greats of the classical period, Haydn, Mozart, and the young rebel, Beethoven. And their music all has similar classical traits. Perfect musical structures, light transparent textures, melodic dominance, and an adherence to the rules of harmony. In 1792, like Mozart, Beethoven traveled to Vienna and set up home there. He stayed there for the rest of his life, becoming extremely famous. Famous for being the center of the musical scene, but equally famous for wandering the streets dressed like a vagrant shouting at everybody. He was always the irascible, grumpy man. By the end of his life, in 1827, Beethoven had revolutionized every single type of music that he touched, and a new period was underway, the Romantic Era. But back in 1799, when this piece was written, we're still firmly in the classical period, and we can hear Mozart and Haydn's influence in the music. Beethoven's septet was written in 1799. It was a good time for Beethoven. He had just established himself in Vienna and had started writing his first string quartets and piano sonatas and coming to the public's attention. The septet is very closely like a serenade, and a serenade was the most popular form of music around the turn of the 19th century. The serenade was popular because it features a small ensemble of instruments, so even the poorest rich families could afford eight or nine instrumentalists to play at their parties. Serenades were celebration pieces that were played often outdoors at parties. They were of a light type of music, nothing too taxing to listen to, and they were often dedicated to the person that had paid for them. This serenade has all of those features, but Beethoven develops it further in his choice of instruments. Because he chooses seven single instruments, he doesn't double the violins or the wind. It means that everybody is freed up to have their own role. We don't have to have two violins competing. Instead, we have a clarinet who can take on some of the melodies. The addition of the double bass means that the sound is much weightier. And it also means that the cello and the bassoon can have much more interesting and higher melodies. This piece was first performed in 1800 and published in 1802. It became a massive success because of the amount of variety in its six movements. Beethoven wasn't happy about this. He thought the piece was a bit too lightweight and wasn't as good as his later, greater works. And it particularly angered Beethoven because this is the last piece that he heard properly before his hearing started to fail. So, if we look at the six movements that make up this piece, and just take a glance at the titles of those movements, you can see that there's something for everyone there. There's a second slow movement, which is very emotional and lovely. There's a theme and, um, theme and variations. Everybody loves theme and variations. There's a minuet and trio, which you can dance to, a scherzo, which will be nice and bouncy and fun. And at the end, there's a march. So that's why this piece was so popular. We are going to focus on just the first movement, which is in sonata form. And of course, we all know now that sonata form is based on three sections. An exposition section, where the composer exposes his ideas, a development section, where those ideas are developed further, and a recapitulation where those ideas come back but are now in the home key. Beethoven starts outside of this sonata form structure with a slow adagio introduction. This is something that he borrowed from Haydn. So let's start by hearing the first 18 bars which make up that adagio introduction. <laughs>
The idea of a slow introduction before the sonata movement is something that Beethoven borrowed from his old friend Haydn. Haydn would put a slow introduction at the beginning of his symphonies to establish the key, and that's exactly what Beethoven is doing here. Now, before we unpick what's going on, a little word about what you're going to see on the screen. In your scores, you might see that the clarinet and the horn parts are at the written pitch. On the screen, we're going to see them at the sounding pitch, in concert pitch. That's just to make the chords easier to identify. But do be careful when you're cross-referencing between what you see on the screen and what you see in your score. The viola is, of course, in alto clef, and the double bass sounds an octave lower than what it looks like. We've also taken out many of the dynamics and articulation. That's not because they aren't important, it's just to make things look a little less cluttered and to be able us to see exactly what we need to see today. So let's look at the opening nine bars a bit closer. And on the screen, you'll see we've condensed it down a bit so that it makes things a bit clearer. Let's just hear bars one to eight. <laughs> basically made up of a soft violin solo, which is, of course, monophonic, surrounded by big, tutti, full orchestral chords. Those three violin notes at bar two, which thicken at bar four and bar six when the whole ensemble play them, are one of Beethoven's key motifs in this whole movement. I'm going to call those the three knocks. We'll come across them again soon. By the way, during this introduction, they are emphasized further by the use of appoggiaturas in bars two, four, and six. Those are accented dissonances at work again. The chords here establish the key that we're in, and they do so by moving to the dominant and back again. Beethoven uses chromatic harmony featuring a Neapolitan sixth chord in bar seven. This is a chord that Beethoven loved, just like Mozart loved it, because it's a nice way of slipping between keys. So let's really unpick what this chord is. It happens at bar seven. And the chord we're going to is B flat. So you take the second degree of B flat, which is C, you flatten it, that's C flat. Here on the screen, it's expressed as a B natural. And the sixth comes from the interval between the A and the F sharp. It then resolves inwards to B flat and towards F. It's a slippery way of modulating to the dominant. So let's move on to the next few bars. We have bars eight to 10 on the screen now, just the strings. And you can see the most important motif of the whole piece, which I'm gonna call the turn. It's just those three quavers at the end of the bar. It's another anacrusis idea because it's moving towards the first beat of the next bar. Let's listen to bars eight to 18. was so popular is because of the variety of different textures in it. In that introduction, we've had three different textures. We've had monophony, the solo violin, bars <coughs> one to six. Then bars eight to 11, we had a three-part strings texture accompanied by chords. And then in bars 12 to 14, we had melody-dominated homophony. The melody, of course, is played by the violin. In bar 18, we're firmly established as being the dominant chord of the movement. The clarinet downwards arpeggio is there just in case you missed all of Beethoven's clever harmonic work. The clarinet just plays the dominant seventh chord downwards, readying us for the allegro sonata form movement. So let's begin by hearing the exposition section in full, bars 18 to 111. <laughs> Thank you. 
exposition is made up of two contrasting themes, one in the tonic key and one in a related key. That's exactly what we've got here. The first subject theme begins at bar 18 and lasts for 10 bars. Here it is again, bars 19 to 29. <laughs> The main melody is played on the violin and features that little turn idea I pointed out from the introduction. We hear it going up in sequence and sketching out the tonic triad of E flat. I'm going to highlight that in red on the screen. The viola and the cello are accompanying the theme with diatonic harmony using the chords that you'd expect. And the harmonic rate speeds up as we approach the cadence. So the first chord lasts for four bars. Then there's one chord per bar and then there's two chords in every bar. There's a little bit of chromatic decoration in the melody at bar 26 in the violin, and the cadence at bar 28 is the first of many 1C, 5, 7, 1 perfect cadences. After that, Beethoven repeats the tune exactly the same, but this time he gives it to the clarinet and varies the accompaniment. A simple Alberti bass feature that we had before is changed into a syncopated string chord. He also adds a walking bass and held harmony from the horn and the bassoon. Let's listen to that, bars 28 to 39. <laughs> So the first subject is just a 10-bar melody repeated twice with different instrumentation. Because of that anacrusis idea, the repeat actually overlaps with the first time you hear it. And that helps to make the piece not sound so predictable. At bar 40, we start our transition to the dominant key and to the second subject. And the really important motif is in this transition. <laughs> is making further use of the ideas we first heard in the introduction. The three knocks are back, but now we're in 4-4, so it's three knocks and a gap. There's also the alternating texture, the solo violin and the tutti chords. Even the dynamic contrast is back. But the idea that's really important I'm going to call the transition tune. It's a running scale started by a little ornament that was played there by the violin. It's followed by the three knocks. Above 47, we have the third texture Beethoven has used in this piece, antiphonal scoring. That's where you have two groups of instruments alternating. Here, we have the wind alternating with the strings, again, with a sneaky little overlap. And underneath, the harmony is very much establishing us in B-flat, the dominant key, especially at bars 51 and 52, which are just B-flat and E-flat chords back and forth. So we're all set for the second subject group. Now, we have to call it the second subject group rather than the second subject theme because Beethoven, being the revolutionary, it's made up of three ideas. Let's listen to the first idea, which is bars 53 to 60. <laughs> As expected, the mood has changed. Things are a little bit calmer and smoother. And the texture of the second subject here is homophonic. Everybody's playing the same chords at the same time. We're firmly in the dominant key of B flat, and we have a new four bar tune to outline this. It's played by the strings, and as in the first subject, it's then repeated straight away by the wind with a livelier accompaniment. At bar 61, we get the second thematic idea of the second subject, and the same thing happens. We hear the tune played by one set of instruments, the strings, and then repeated immediately, but this time split between the clarinet and the bassoon with a fuller accompaniment. That's bars 61 to 77. <laughs> So 
far, the sonata has consisted of question and answer phrases and always of equal length. This is an excellent example of periodic phrasing, what we were talking about in the Mozart. Beethoven sticks to it all the way through, and despite the symmetry, he still manages to innovate later on. It doesn't sound as symmetrical as it actually is, and that's partly because of the overlap that he uses to avoid anything sounding too predictable. Did you notice some more chromatic decoration there, bar 68, leading, leading into the clarinet repeat? Other than that, the harmony is exactly as we'd expect, firmly establishing the dominant key of B flat. Another transition follows, bars 76 to 85, with the violin having the most interesting line so far, a string of triplet quavers. This gives the effect of making the music more exciting, and we sort of slightly feel it's speeding up. That's just because the duration of the notes has gotten shorter. This passage further establishes the key and takes us to the third second subject idea at bar 87. Let's listen to this transition with the triplet quavers, followed by that new idea. It's actually quite hard to pick up around here because of all the overlapping, but we're going to go from 76. <laughs> idea of the second subject is actually really different to all of the others. It features one rhythm, staccato notes, and everybody's pretty much playing at the same time. That's called homorhythmic. All the players playing exactly the same rhythm at exactly the same time. First we hear this rhythm played twice by the strings in sequence. Sequence just means that they, when they repeat they start on a different note. Then everybody plays it together with a new harmony. Then there's a small chromatic link before everybody plays it again, ending with a perfect cadence in B flat. Let's listen to that, bar 86 to 98. of harmonic areas in that passage. All diatonic, nothing too unusual, and ending with a classic 1C571 cadence in B-flat. And now we have a codetta, which, as you know, is the ending of a section. Coda being the ending of a full piece, codetta is the ending of a section. And there is the most important tune of the codetta on the screen. It's made up of the turn idea that we talked about earlier, that idea that we first saw in the introduction. And then on the end, there are just four downward crotchet notes. Keeping up with the periodic, even phrasing, Beethoven does his usual trick of having one section play it in full and then repeats it straight away by another section. This time, and for the first time, he changes the order of things. So we first hear it played by the clarinet and then repeated on the violin and elaborated. Listen now also for a B-flat pedal on the horn. This is bars 98 to 111. three perfect cadences back to back which finish off the codetta of the exposition. Time for the development. Let's listen to it before we unpick it. It's bars 111 to 153. <laughs> Thank you. 
as expected, we start in the dominant key of B-flat, but Beethoven doesn't stay there for very long. The first theme we hear is the first subject theme played by everyone. But now, by the end of it, just five bars later, we've started to move to a new tonal area of C minor. Beethoven uses the Codetta theme, played by the clarinet, to make that move to C minor. That's the theme based on the Anacrusis turn and the four falling crotchets. The clarinet plays this idea twice in downward sequence. Remember, a sequence is just a repeat, but starting on a different note. Let's just hear that tune in isolation. This is just the clarinet at bar 117. What we've just heard is a question and answer phrase asked and answered by the same instrument, the clarinet. Beethoven repeats this exactly on the horn, but this time ending up in A flat. So here's just the horn at one, two, one. <laughs> So that's another question and answer played by the same instrument. Simple. Or you could look at it as a big question asked by the clarinet, a four-bar question, answered by a four-bar answer on the horn. The clarinet ending in C minor, the horn ending in A flat, as it's now marked on the screen. So let's listen to that, the clarinet and the horn from 117. got there are two question and answer phrases within a larger question and answer phrase. Two on the clarinet, two on the horn, or just the clarinet versus the horn. Not so simple. After this, Beethoven does the same again, but this time adding another tune into the mix. It's the tune from the transition between the first subject and the second subject. The one with the violin scale. There it is on the screen. And it also has the three knocks. We hear this in two question and answer phrases on the violin, but it also alternates with the wind who are still playing that Codetta theme, creating yet another question and answer within a larger question and answer. Let's hear this passage and listen carefully for what happens at the end of the dialogue on the violin. This is bars 125 to 140. Did you hear that the violin scale goes up at the end of that passage instead of down? It's the only time it does that, and it does it just to create excitement. Upward phrases just sound more exciting than downward phrases. And the three knocks idea is all over that passage, being passed between instruments, again, creating excitement. At bar 140, we have a dominant pedal on the viola that moves to the horn eight bars later. This signals that we're moving back to the tonic key and to the recapitulation. Beethoven continues to work with the codetta theme. That's the one on the screen with the little turn and the four falling notes. But now he alternates it with the first, second subject idea. That's the one made up of four minims. Let's listen to that, bars 140 to 148. <laughs> After eight bars of that, have you noticed how everything seems to be coming in eight, four, or two-bar chunks? That's classical phrasing. Beethoven uses the turn idea to sketch out the dominant seventh chord and therefore bring us back to the tonic and the recapitulation. Now listen carefully to this bit, there's a lot going on. The turn starts to come quick and fast, played antiphonally between the cello, who's sketching out a B-flat chord, and the winds. The horn has a B-flat pedal, and two octaves above that, so does the violin. Pedal notes don't have to be at the bottom. So we've got a two-octave pedal there. The double bass is reinforcing the harmony by slowly marking out the B-flat arpeggio, and at the end of the next extract, the violin joins in with the turn idea as well, playing it back to back over and over again. So this is the end of the development section, bars 148 to 154. <laughs> So after all that,
that dominant preparation, we have to return to the tonic and the recapitulation, which starts at bar 154 with an exact repeat of the first subject. Bars 154 to 165 are exactly the same as bars 18 to 30. But when the clarinet takes over the theme at bar 166, we suddenly and unexpectedly modulate into A flat. You can easily spot that by the sudden appearance of D flats and the E flat seven arpeggios in the upper strings. E flat is of course chord four in A flat. Let's listen up to there, bars 154 to 172. <laughs> modulation has of course happened to prevent us from moving towards the dominant. If Beethoven had carried on repeating the first subject into the second subject as he did at the exposition, we would have headed up in the dominant and we don't want to do that. We want to stay in the tonic key. To guarantee this, Beethoven manipulates some older motifs here at bar 172. Firstly, he creates a new melodic idea from that original turn that we had right back in the introduction. He gives it to the cello and the bass. Let's hear that in isolation at bars 172. <laughs> On top of that, we have syncopated chordal accompaniment from the violin and the viola. Syncopated means that the chords come on the weaker parts of the bar, and that gives it a kind of jaunty rhythm. Let's just hear that at 172. On top of that, we have the second half of the Codetta theme, which is just a falling series of four crotchet notes. This is played by the horn and the clarinet in dialogue with the bassoon. And notice that the three knocks are back, played after the falling four notes. They're lent them to minims rather than crotchets. That's called rhythmic augmentation. The bass turn and the clarinet and horn theme are lined up. So if they're played in isolation, you get the Codetta theme in its entirety. So let's just listen to that, bars 172 without the violin and the viola. We're also in a new tonal area here of A flat. That's chord four of the home key. This passage ends with a quick cadence at bar 180 involving another Neapolitan sixth chord. And we're back to the home key and the other second subject group. Bars 182 to 233 are an exact repeat of 47 to 98, but now transposed into the tonic key. This makes for some very high violin playing as we've gone up a fifth and it was high already, so now it's super high. Let's listen to this chunk in context now, bars 172 to 233. That's the A-flat transition with a new version of the Codetta theme to the second subject group in E-flat.
another texture there. At bars 221 to 231, we've got that homorhythmic texture that we had back in the second subject, third idea, way back at the beginning. Bar 233 is the beginning of the coda, which is a repeat of the codetta, but now beginning and ending in the home key. This coda is greatly expanded into almost a second mini development section. Didn't Mozart do that too in his piano sonata? The fun starts at bar 245. Let's take a look at the screen. Firstly, we have a four bar lowering bass line, which takes us through a Neapolitan sixth chord to the dominant key of B flat. Incidentally, the clarinet has a rising figure to create contrary motion with this bass line. And the upper strings are playing the idea featuring the turn again. Let's listen to just that, two, four, five. At two, four, nine, the cello plays the melodic idea she had earlier back at bar one, seven, two, the one using the turn motif. The violin plays a syncopated dominant pedal on B flat using a rhythm from earlier. The horn enters with a new question developed from the original codetta theme, and this is answered by a, the clarinet. At 255, as you'd expect, this material is repeated and reorchestrated, but Beethoven adds something new into the mix. The whole melody is shifted down to the lower strings. The wind now imitate this smooth melody entering after just two bars. So we have imitation for the first time in the piece. This is a new feature, a new duet texture at the very end of the piece. The violin has the cello figure, but it now acts as a counter melody to the smooth tune. Counter melody is also a new feature, showing up at the very end of the piece. Let's hear that. This is 249 to 269. extract finished with a brief return to that transition theme. That's the one with the semiquaver violin scales and the three knocks from way back in bar 40. We're back in the home key, thanks to those three knocks. To finish off the passage, we have to just have a cadence to end off the whole piece. This is really the coda proper, starting at 269 to the end. The harmony is reinforced with simple diatonic chords, and all that remains is a cadence. Now, Beethoven was one of the true masters of the cadence, and to help us, he introduces a new trill figure, which we first hear on the viola and then on the violin. It's a trill and then an appoggiatura. We're gonna play count the cadence now. So we're gonna play the last chunk and I want you to see if you can count how many five one cadences there are. These are all simple cadences, so they're quite easy to hear. Let's hear two, six, nine to the end. <laughs> There were 10 perfect cadences in those last 14 bars. And the cadences decrease from whole bar chords to minims to crutches to increase the expectation and excitement of the ending. We're gonna perform the whole piece for you now and flag up the structure on the screen. But before we do so, let's firstly just bullet point some of the major factors you need to remember. We have a sonata form movement in E flat. It begins with an adagio introduction, which establishes the key by moving away from it and moving back again, and features motifs to be developed later on. The exposition is bars 18 to 111, featuring two main thematic groups. The first subject is at bar 18 in the tonic key and features question and answer structure. Started on the violin, answered on the clarinet. There's a long transition to the second subject group. The second subject group, not second subject theme, second subject group, which begins at bar 54. The second subject is actually made up of three ideas, each with a different texture. The development section starts at bar 111, features more distant tonal areas, and constant question and answer structure. The recapitulation starts at 154. 
the first and subject theme appear in E flat. It's almost an exact repeat of the first and second subject at the beginning, but now in the tonic key. So Beethoven has to use a new transition to ensure that that happens. There's an extended coda at bar 233 based on the codetta from the exposition, but with new ideas, including a clarinet and bassoon imitative duet and a new trill figure in the final cadence. The piece is highly typical of the classical period because of the diatonic chords, the classical standard chord progressions you'd expect, plus the occasional chromatic movement in the melody. There are clear cadential points, often featuring 1C571. Periodic symmetrical question and answer phrasing throughout. Melodic dialogue exchanges between instruments as well. The piece has many different textures, which just adds to its appeal. There's a slow introduction featuring monophony. The sonata structure, which is perfect, features melody-dominated homophony. There are moments of two and three-part texture and tiffinal scoring during the first subject transition. Beethoven uses imitation in the coda and much of the second subject is homorhythmic. The classical period was obsessed with symmetry and this piece is completely symmetrical, both in its phrase lengths and in its overall structure. Finally, let's listen to the whole movement without any repeats. Watch the screen because we're going to pinpoint all of the important sections on it. <laughs> 